Hey lovers, welcome to TSPN. We are wrapping up Singapore shows, so let's take it to Thai and see what has been going on there. Taylor just wrapped up her final shows for the Eras Tour for the next two months, and we have so much that we need to talk about. Last weekend marked the very first time that a female performer has ever had six consecutive shows at National Stadium there in Singapore, with Taylor Swift bringing in over 368,000 Swifties to her shows. However, that's not all, as outside the stadium, over 10,000 Swifties gathered every night, adding an additional 60,000 to that number. While these shows were extremely exciting, they were also bittersweet, as we saw the final performances of Sabrina Carpenter on the Eras Tour, bringing an end to those new nonsense outros that we've enjoyed every weekend. But what a weekend to finish out your tenure on the Eras Tour, as after she helped Taylor break that record, she also got to hang out with Travis Kelsey and all of his friends who traveled all the way from the States to see those shows in Singapore. But of course, it wasn't just the people who attended those shows that made them so exciting. As we got new ad-libs during the Red Era, 22 hats were passed, Taylor talked about her mom growing up there in Singapore, and we even got some Easter eggs for Reputation Taylor's version. Alongside all those surprises, we also got some awesome surprise mashups, with Taylor even making reference to the beginning of the Eras Tour as we draw nearer and nearer to that anniversary date of March 17th. Those mashups being Death by a Thousand Cuts and Babe on the guitar for night four, followed by 15 and you're on your own kid on the piano. Then on night five, we got Sparks Fly and Gold Rush on the guitar with False God and Slut on the piano. Finally, on night six, Taylor made that reference to the beginning of the Eras Tour, playing a mashup of Tim McGraw and Cowboy Like Me on the guitar, and following that with a mashup of Mirrorball and Epiphany on the piano. Now, if you didn't know, Mirrorball and Tim McGraw were the very first two surprise songs that we ever heard on the Eras Tour back in Glendale, Arizona last year in March. All that being said, the Eras Tour is still going strong and will return to Paris, France this May. So buckle up and make sure you're back here in just a few weeks as we recap the final performances on the biggest tour the world has ever seen. All right. Great. Thank you so much, Ty, as always. So that was the last of Ty for a few weeks. As we know, Taylor is on a break currently. And so, Jesse, what are some initial thoughts? We've got the surprise songs that, that Ty just ran through. We had a ton of mashups again. I really liked 15 and You're On Your Own, Kid. So... If you noticed, she didn't include the verse in 15 where she says greater than the dating the boy on the football team because she is dating the boy on the football team. <laughs> she did the greater things and now she's dating the boy on the football team. Yeah, that's a good point. I love that for her. Yeah. Um, 15 was actually one of the songs that was in my show. Uh, I did Nashville Night 2. And uh, it was one of the like, obviously, there wasn't a mashup. It was the full song on piano. So um, I feel I don't feel sad. I know you kind of said that whenever she repeated one of your songs that you'd seen, but it did feel weird. <laughs> yeah, it does. It feels kind of off. Like when she did, I wish you would. It didn't feel too sad, but it felt off. Now, if she does the lakes, then I might get a little salty. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so there's a lot of rumors flying around right now. As in, there might be a change up to the Eras Tour, a second leg to the Eras Tour, more dates, um, adding Tortured Poets as an era. I don't think it's going to change up that much just because it's such a well orchestrated show. There's, I mean, all the LED screens are right on time with the dancers and Taylor, and she's not lip syncing. So I think Tortured Poets is going to be revealed in the surprise song set. I think she'll probably do a mashup and then she'll do a new song during the surprise song set after Torture Poets comes out. Yeah, the orchestration of the stage managers, the dancers, the band, all of the people have to be in place at the right time or else it gets really dangerous. Yeah. You know, I was actually thinking about this the other day with Post Malone being on uh, the Tortured Poets when he was in St. Louis 
probably like last year, the year before he fell into a hole on the stage during the show. And he actually got back, I think he got back up and finished, but then he had actually posted after and like apologized and he broke ribs. Yeah. He broke ri- three ribs, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, think about that. Like the, you're walking, they're not actually probably seeing very well. There's lights, there's sometimes confetti. You've got the dancers who are riding bikes around during the 1989, like blank space. Like there's a lot going on in the coordination of the dancers and the lights. And again, the stage people, the ones that are doing the moving of the parts, like that's not a small, hey, let's totally flip up the entire tour. If anything, it would be small. It might be removing a song to add one or something here or there, but I just, I would be surprised too. Like a speak now type Mm -hmm. of situation. Yeah, I could see her maybe, but God, it's like you either do the damn thing or you don't, you know, like I don't think towards towards I can't say the name tortured poets is just getting a single song like I feel like if you're gonna do the you know the set of it she's not gonna choose just one song I don't think that tortured poets is gonna have its own I think tortured poets is an era I do think we are entering a new era it's the tortured poets era however I don't think we're gonna see that era on the era's tour just like we don't see debut on the era's tour very, very true. Very true. I thought this is a thought that I had, and I don't know if I saw a TikTok or if I dreamt it. So I apologize because I, I don't know where this came from. But it would be interesting is if in the future she did her tours by like choosing a few at a time, like her top three. Maybe there was something about top five that made me think of it, you know, like in my top five. But like I question if in the future her tours would be you know, red, speak now and debut, right? Or like she like starts grouping them. And again, like she's not going to tour forever. So I don't know if that's actually like a plausible thing, but I could see her being like 50 years old and doing that. I can't even fathom what another tour would look like for her after this. Well, exactly. That's where I feel as though it's got to be some mixing of it, right? Or she's got to do something that, um, I mean, she doesn't have to do anything. Like she could just, well, she could also just show up and just sing to a microphone and a guitar without costume changes or lights and we would all show up. So, um, but she's a big advocate for giving the experience. That's why she does go all out because she had an experience as a young child with Leanne Rhymes going to her show and she wrote her a bunch of letters and sent them to her ahead of the show. And so when Leanne saw her, when the meet and greet happened after, she was like, Leanne, I love you. And Leanne Rhymes was like, thank you, Taylor, because she had watched the videos or whatever she sent and read the letters. And she talks about that experience being one that was very formative for how she treats her fans. And this is a little teaser because I've been watching stuff for the the Swifty 101 series that we're going to do. We've been going back and listening to a lot of stuff um, and really engulfing ourselves in the era and prep for these really specific episodes that we're going to be rolling out. But to me, when I think about Taylor and the way she tours and the shows she puts on the big production, like that is where that's coming from. It's for the fans. Well, and I'm pretty confident in saying that this is probably the biggest tour of all time. Of all time. Like, this has beat the Beatles. I believe this has beat Michael Jackson. Um, The Eras Tour is going to be a tour that will be remembered forever. And it's going to be hard to top it monetarily, you know, count, body count-wise. Um Yep. The amount of time she's on stage, the amount of places she goes, and just how big it is in general to the economy of where the where the stop is. Yeah, I agree with that. Okay, so another thing to talk about is the surprise song set the very final day, which was night six. She did Tim McGraw in Cowboy Like Me, and then her second song on the piano was Mirror Ball with Epiphany. <laughs> Okay, so she started in Glendale, Arizona, and her surprise set was Mirrorball on the guitar and Tim McGraw on the piano. So she started the Eras tour with it. Now she's ended this part of the Eras tour with it, which is what's fueling, I think, a lot of the theories and rumors. 
But what's interesting to me is how, and they were part of mashups. So, you know, Tim McGraw and Cowboy Like Me and then Mirabal and Epiphany. But yep. what's what's interesting to me is that she reversed it. She flip-flopped it. So she did Tim McGraw on the guitar instead of the piano and Mirabal on the piano instead of the guitar. It's like she mirrored the bookends. Yes, bookends. That's going to be a big thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You used that term in a TikTok recently, too. Um, I feel as though, well, and she did do bookends for the holiday collection, I believe. She did the Speak Now ones. Weren't they like horses? That and for the whole Midnight's era, the hashtag was TS Midnight TS. Hmm. I never yeah. thought about that. Mm -hmm. It was a bookend hashtag. Mm hmm. Like on each side. Um, yeah. One of the things I actually wrote down the quote. Um, before she sang Tim McGraw. So we're in night six in Singapore and she is about to sing her surprise song. And she said, basically she referenced that this leg of the tour was going to end and that she was feeling nostalgic. And I thought I would go back to the beginning. Yes. And that's what sp spurred me to spiral. And I did my latest TikTok on that. Has she sang Begin Again? She has. Um, okay. It's been a while. Yeah, that just that just sparked my brain. I actually hadn't thought of it till just now, but that was the one that I thought she would sing with Travis coming in. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. Hmm. I wonder if that has any significance, actually. Hold on. Let me check and see when she sang that. I watched it Begin Again. I love that song so much. That was like one of my favorite songs on Red. Okay, so 423, night three, Houston, she did begin again on guitar, and then cold as you. Don't know if that has any significance, but yeah, I don't know. If anyone's listening and that rings a bell, it's not clicking with me. It's like, yeah. Not yet, but yeah. Because she did say, we're going to go back to the beginning, which was very odd to me. Yeah. Yeah, literally. That's why I wrote it down because it stood out as, you know, when she's just talking and when she's given us a talk, that felt like one where she was saying the words intentionally. Yep. There's something about beginnings and endings for sure. And I don't know if it has to do with Tortured Poets being the ending of the relationship with Joe, reputation being the beginning. That's what I kind of had my TikTok about. But what if it's debut, the beginning? Could be. It could be because it's such a strange thing for her to say because we're not done with the tour. So it's not mm -hmm. like we're done and the era's tour ended and she's saying, oh, I'm going to go back to the beginning. No, we don't even know when the last date's going to be. I don't even think she's announced it yet. Yeah, she definitely hasn't said anything to indicate that she's done. Um, you know, like nothing that literally says it. Um, all right. So still sticking in Singapore, Travis showed up. Travis showed up. Travis showed up. Um, he went to two concerts, I believe. Right? Oh, I don't know. I think he was there for two. Um, maybe not. That I don't know, honestly. I know he was at one for sure. Um, honestly, him being there is old news now, right? We're not even keeping count. But he no. did do the dancing, which was fun. Whenever she said the guy on the Chiefs, I think that was the real big viral moment. And every time he's there, she is doing Guy on the Chiefs. So if he's not there, she's not doing the lyric change. If he's there, she's doing the lyric change. But you know what I've been seeing that's so stupid? I got to talk about this. Okay, so people are saying that he, well, he was caught, like someone filmed him texting during the show. Oh, no. <laughs> like, seriously, get over yourselves. Like, it, if he's texting, who, how do you know? Like, he might have even been texting her. Like, oh my God, this is this part we're on right now and this just happened. His like, mom, his brother, his like, friends. Who cares? Like, I was up. texting my husband. Plus, it's like his third or fourth show. So, like, I mean, if he and he's going to go to several more. So, when you see something that much, that often, you know, you're not going to be, like, paying attention to every little thing. I don't yeah. Know. Yeah, I agree. I think it's silly.
All right. So obviously, um, we've talked a lot about new variants coming out in these episodes because when she's on tour, she has been announcing the different variants of the Tortured Poets Department during the surprise song set. The second half of Singapore, which is what we're covering right now, we did not get a variant announced during that weekend. However, we did get the Target variant announcement, which is always expected, and we're excited to hear about that. So, Jesse, you want to give us a little um, nugget of recap there? Okay, yes. So, I'm just going to tell you guys the variants that are out right now, okay? So, there's Ghost White, which is Manuscript, Smoke Gray, which is The Bolter, Beige Parchment, which was The Albatross, Ink Black is the Black Dog, and then we just got the Target exclusive that is going to feature the manuscript again. It's not a new ending song, but the name of the vinyl is Phantom Clear. So five, there are five variants, and I think this is going to be it. But what stuck out to me right away was that the first variant is Ghost, and the last one is Phantom. Okay. So this is where this threw me kind of into a spiral, because if we're thinking about Joe and Taylor and the fact that tortured poets will probably have a lot to do with the ending of their relationship, the beginning of their relationship is reputation. First song, ready for it. First verse, but if he's a ghost, then I can be a phantom. She says it right there. It's all it's in the same line. So that to me just kind of had me spiraling about beginnings and endings. And I don't know. What are your thoughts, Anna? Um, Yeah, I think, well, it's another bookend because ghosts and phantoms are essentially the same thing. Um, I the word phantom to me stood out because phantom of the opera is something that I started searching when she showed up to the Grammys and that gown with the long um, gloves and the lace, uh, she had the little lace fan. Like that was just one of the places that my mind went. I'm not sure that I've closed the loop there here with them using phantom, but, um, there's definitely something very special about that word. She has used it in a couple songs. It appeared again in the, uh, beautiful ghosts, Mm -hmm. which she sings about ghosts. And then she also mentions phantom. So it's not like a new word for Taylor. Um, but yeah, another thing that stood out to me about the announcement of the Target variant is that it doesn't have an exclusive track. And we've talked a little bit about that of do we think that the bonus tracks that are being announced with each variant are going to be exclusive to the vinyl or the CD? Or do we think that they'll be on streaming? And so I think it is interesting because if you look at, for example, Midnight's, there were four variants that were available to purchase through her website and obviously other stores eventually. Um, And those did not have anything special as regards to bonus tracks, but there was a Target exclusive that had hits different as an exclusive bonus track. So again, five variants for that. We had five variants for 1989 Taylor's version. So same thing. The four that you could purchase through the site had different colors, different artwork, all of that, no extra bonus track. And the one that you got through Target did. So, yeah. So, I think this goes back to your point that you've made before, where that, like the Albatross and the Black Dog, it's all going to be available for streaming when the album comes out, I think. I think so too. Maybe she'll put them in like different playlists. You know how, like, we had like 17 versions of the Midnights, whatever. Like, I could see her doing the release of them in their own kind of groupings. But what else kind of stood out, I thought I had heard that something was happening with her Target exclusive contract. Like maybe she doesn't, like there was something last year and I could look further into that. I should have done my research before recording, but it stood out that she didn't have an exclusive to me with Target because that does pull less weight for people having to go to Target to get the exclusive track. Yeah. I know I have not heard that, but I know that it's like a tradition for a lot of people to go to Target and get it the night it comes out, um, film themselves doing it. I mean, like I've seen that. I've never done that, but I have I have seen it. It's like a tradition. Are we going to do it together in South Carolina this year? I don't I think, know if I'm going to get up. <laughs> I don't know. I kind of want to now. <laughs> yeah, we'll be. Uh, so the, for those that don't know, we'll be at the University of South Carolina, ironically, it was already a, an event that we were attending 
prior mm-hmm. to the announcement of Tortured Poets, and there will be some other creators there. Um, I know Liz, um, Liz 17, 117, Liz, one, Liz 117. Yes, that's a better way to say it. Liz 117, she's somebody who does the Target variant every time, and she's really excited. And I was imagining waking up early and going to Target with her after listening to the Tortured Poets all night, and I'm like, I, I don't know if I can do it. <laughs> Yeah, we um we are going to be tired, but that is an event that we are going to report on for you guys. Um, we are going to be speaking at the University of South Carolina, uh, where it was very gracious of them to invite us. And there will be some other creators there. We're not going to reveal who's going to be there yet, but we will soon. Yeah, there may be a seat or two still kind of up in the air, but I'm very excited. And of course, we'll have um, Jesse and I will be together listening to the tortured poets, which I'm really excited about. I've never done like a filming of myself, like a, you know, instant reaction. So uh, we'll we'll definitely capture it. I don't know if it will be a formal podcast episode or we'll just throw it on our YouTube, but um, we'll definitely capture footage of reactions because I am I'm feeling like there's going to be some like nuggets in here. Like, you know, whenever she's saying, I wouldn't marry me either, a pathological people pleaser who only wanted mm-hmm. you to see her. I wish I had captured my reaction to that because it is what? Uh, oh, my gosh. I know my my moment with that was blue dress on a boat. And I still get chills. And I'm like, I know what she's talking about. I know the picture. I know that moment. <laughs> I did not. So I knew it was something, but I'm like, what the fuck? Blue dress on? You know, I had to search it. So I feel like since all of us creators will be together, there will not, we will not miss a damn thing. Somebody is going to know something mm-hmm. about every line. So, right. Cause it won't just be me and Anna during this listening party that we are recording. There will be other creators that you know. So, yeah, a couple you might have seen on the pod. Maybe. Um, I say maybe to like retract it to make it mysterious, Um, but even beyond that as well. So very exciting. Um, So Phantom Clear, another thing that stood out to me about that, we were talking a little bit about this. So Jessie did a video on her TikTok that she talked a little bit about the different variant colors, and we can get a little bit into that. But you had mentioned all the times that she has referenced ghosts in her music. And one that stood out to me was the bad blood reference to it. So you live, it's band-aids don't fix bullet holes. You say sorry just for show. If you live like that, you live with ghosts. I have never hit the lines like that on this damn podcast without looking it up. So that was wild. Um, but yeah, I know. Thank you. It's probably because we've just talked about it. But um, the that moment during the Eras tour, there is a version of Taylor on the screen who is dressed in like this sexy little negligee with a long lacy robe. And she goes into the, she's in the lover house in the visuals. Yes. All black. Yes. If I didn't say that black. Um, And she is in the lover house, which is basically barren to the bone. It's, it's all wood and she lights it on fire which we know is a big visual for things that are happening right now. Okay, hold on. There's two different houses, and it's not the lover house she's burning down. Oh, that's a good point. Do we need to – yeah, we probably do need to say – I think Nikki, Nikki King 23 on TikTok, does a good job of this, talking about the differences. When you look at the tour visuals, there are two versions of the lover house behind her. So you have the lover house that you see in the music video that was featured during the holiday collection. And the biggest difference is going to be that center row of rooms is more narrow. And then the rooms on the outside are much more wide. Whereas a lot of the featured house that you see on the tour behind her as she's singing has a different breakout. Like the rooms in the center are very, very wide and the ones on the outside are narrow. So like if you're actually just looking at the puzzle pieces of the room, it does seem as though there's two totally different versions. And so there's been basically thoughts around, is this the old house of her old work that she's going to burn down and build a new Jesse, do you want to add to that at all? Or is it an actual replica of one of her homes that she shared with Joe? Like, I mean, it maybe it doesn't even have anything to do with the lover house. Um, but it's definitely yeah. that house, not the lover house. It's definitely that different version that she strikes, yeah, strikes the match and lights it on fire. And then 
disappears like a phantom. Yeah, like phantom clear. So when she does that on the tour is during bad blood right before she says, Band-Aids don't fix bullet holes. You say sorry just for show. If you live like that, you live with ghosts. You say sorry just for show. Let's backtrack. A few weeks ago, she did the surprise song mashup of You're Not Sorry with you should have said no <laughs> so you say sorry just for show you live like that you live with ghosts and she disappears like you said like a phantom like it's, so this mm -hmm. is coming together guys i don't know what it is but it's getting me really excited for tortured poets oh my gosh i know i can't wait okay so check out jesse's tiktok too because she goes a little bit more in depth about the storyline between you know the ghost We've got the smoke of the house, even referencing some of the things she did in Midnight's, like the little teaser video with the calendar being, mm -hmm. um, being the, what is it? The ghost? It's so, from the archer. Yeah. So the, there's a TikTok on Taylor's account and it's the one with the manifest calendar. And that whole room is from the song, the archer, a hundred, a hundred thrown out speeches. I almost said to you, you see all the speeches crumpled up um invisible smoke you know yep. i pace like a ghost there's someone writing a ghost writer like it's it's just all from that song and i've done some tiktoks on that yeah yeah well and i think the biggest thing is now that we've got the f five variant names you know the idea of the smoke and we've got parchment parchment paper doesn't burn Apparently yep. there's like a craft parchment paper, you know, like old parchment paper was made out of like animal skin. And then now there's like a craft level parchment paper, like something that would be more of like what you would write on. Um, but then you have baking parchment, which um, is more of a silicone lined. I was talking with Megan from Into the Swiftyverse and she was saying you couldn't write on regular parchment that you would bake. But I did this morning and my pen worked just fine on it. And I feel like since she bakes as a, like all the cookies and stuff that the mm -hmm. parchment paper references that. And so if she burned down the house and her her poems and her lyrics were written on parchment paper, which she has referenced during the tour, writing on parchment, there's something to it all. It is. And there's um there's a line in the bridge of You're on Your Own Kid where she's she says, in a blood soaked gown, I saw something they couldn't take away. Is that what she said? What's the lyric? I looked, I looked around, around in a blood-soaked blood gown, gown and, and I saw, saw something, something they can't take, they can't it take away. Gun. Okay. Yeah. That's what I'm thinking of is like, what can't they take away? Because Joe's gone, her work was gone, all this stuff, but they couldn't take her words. Yeah. And the words don't burn because it's on parchment. Gives me chills. Love it. Let's talk about Detective Swift is what I'm calling this uh, section of the podcast. So as we've mentioned, we are going back in time. We're going to be doing an episode per era, and that's going to take a while because we've got to do the research. So we're starting with debut, obviously, and we won't have this out by Friday. It's something that we're going to record this next week and edit back. And so we'll just start to sprinkle them out with our regular content. Um, but starting in debut, I was listening to Taylor's very first national radio interview. So if you go on YouTube, you can watch it. Just search like Taylor Swift. The title of it's age 16, first national radio interview, 2006. It was posted six years ago, but, um, the interviewer asked her if you were not going to be a recording artist, what would you be? And she said, I would be a cop. Not like a traffic cop, but like a CSI cop or an investigator. And then she also says that she took criminal justice for two years and she really liked it, which uh, one of the commenters on a TikTok I made about this actually pointed out that Travis's degree is in criminal justice. And I fact checked that and that is correct. So shout out to Buffy Lawless 70. I made sure to write that one down. Um, for that comment, because small detail, but that's a pretty cool thing if he um, majored in that and uh, she's very interested in it. So this got me thinking, right, because Taylor likes 
clues, right? This is not a secret. Even in that interview, she talked about how she started putting clues in her lyric books. And so she's always been Easter egging and dropping clues and codes. And so I started to think about how the tortured poet's whole theme is like artifacts. There's some posts where she puts, um, was it new file? And entered into evidence. Entered into evidence was one that Taylor Nation used. And then like whenever she was announcing the different variants, she put like new file. Let me mm -hmm. look. Is that what it was? Was it case file or new file? I think it was case. Let me look. Okay. It says file name. File, file name. We're both wrong. Yeah, exactly. Um, but still, you know, that's if you're thinking about criminal investigation. So then I was like, is TTPD like NYPD? Like the New York Police Department? Is it like the Taylor Police Department? And I don't think she has, you know, the, obviously we know what the acronym is for. Um, but a lot of us initially went to academia. You know, mm -hmm. she's a professor of the Tortured Poets Department. But what if it's like a police department or a criminal justice department? Well, and she calls herself, what, the chairman of the, mm -hmm. and then there's, I think they've had a couple other department head names that she's said for tortured poets. But what is the show with, I don't even know how to say her name right, Mariska Haggerty, and she named her cat Olivia Benson after her? Yeah, what that is that? Law and Order SVU, the Special Victims Unit. Um, and then Taylor was a guest on CSI in like 2009, I think. Uh, yeah, so she likes both of those shows, which are very much mm -hmm. solving murder mysteries. Like forever, I thought Olivia's name was after Olivia Pope from Scan. Was it Scandal? Scandal. Or yeah. Yeah. So either way, Taylor loves those kind of shows. I mean, even Grey's Anatomy have pieces in it that you need to kind of put together. Like we also see on Evermore with SD. SD. What's the name of that song? SD. Oh my God! What's wrong with me today? SD had. Da, 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 Olive Garden every Tuesday night. Because <laughs> that whole song is about like... No body, no crime. No body, no crime. What's wrong with me? Evermore is my favorite goddamn album, too. You were trying to spell it out, and I was just like, I was, I don't even know. I was blank staring, waiting for it to just click. <laughs> okay. Oh, my God. Yeah, no, no body, no crime. Yes, that's a perfect example. You have Hits Different. Right? What are the lyrics of that one? Does she I have... trace the I I trace the evidence, try to make some sense make while it the world... makes some sense. Mm-hmm. Okay, we'll I look it trace up. The ev People are gonna be like, you guys are not Taylor Swift fans. <laughs> We're posers. <laughs> well, we have to talk about so many different people don't know how hard this is. Well, my brain doesn't work that way. No, I have to literally sing it. I've got, okay, hold on. I am thinking that, pos okay, if Joe was unfaithful, maybe she did start keeping receipts and collect the artifacts or whatever. I'm not saying he was. Don't come for me. I love Joe Alwyn. We know I'm a Joe Alwyn stan. For now. Um, until Tortured Poets comes out and something changes my mind. Yeah. Ooh, it says ghost in there too. I used to switch out these Kens. I just ghost. Mm-hmm. Rip the Band-Aid off. Band-Aids don't fix bullet holes, like you were saying. Yeah. <gasps> I find the artifacts. Cried over hat. Cursed the space that I needed. I traced the evidence. Make it make some sense why the wound is still bleeding. You were the one that I loved. So Jessie, you guys keep hitting Jessie, difference. In stop. Why the wound is still bleeding. I stood there in a blood-soaked gown and I saw something they can't take away. <gasps> Chills. <laughs> the wound. What? The wound. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yes. Like argumentative, antithetical dream girl. Because she's arguing like a case too. Keep hit Hits Different has always bothered me like I think there's several clues in here and I think that she's going to maybe give us like a hits different part two or something in tortured poets that's gonna make this make more sense this is why they shouldn't kill off the main guy yeah 
I heard your key turn in the door down the hallway. Is that your key in the door? Is it okay? Is it you? I, I have so many theories about this song, but. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we've talked a lot about keys and I'm actually going to circle back to that because of some of the things we're going to talk about with other mysteries. So when we started thinking about the artifacts and, you know, all the little knickknacks that are going to come with the CD specifically, it made me think of Nancy Drew. So we, Jesse and I, we have talked about Nancy Drew before we started this pod. She actually did a TikTok back, I think in December, just about it. And you started to pull together some things that were tying as far as the name. So do you want to real quick, give us your take on Nancy Drew? It was around the beginning of December when everybody was clowning about National Wear Your Pearls Day, December 15th. So I started to kind of dig into that a little bit more. There was a lot of really good theories. And someone had sent me a message somewhere in an inbox somewhere. I am so sorry. I do not know who that was. If it's you, tag yourself, please, or say something in the comments. But they mentioned to me that there was a Nancy Drew book called The 13th Pearl, which immediately caught my attention. So I go look it up and it's Nancy Drew, to me, the caricature, the painting of her, very much resembled Taylor when she was on Olivia the cat in the Karma music video. And she had on pearls, right? Pearl earrings, pearl necklace. The pearl necklace that she was wearing, and I cannot remember the designer at the moment, it was 12 pearls. Taylor had added a 13th pearl to it to make it 13, her favorite number. So that kind of was a connection for me, like, ooh, maybe we should look a little bit more into Nancy Drew. Now, with you just talking about all the evidence and the artifacts and the detective stuff, Nancy Drew is a series of books, if you don't know, about detect. She's a detect, an amateur detective, right? And it was most of her books came out in the 50s and 60s. Yeah, she was like 16. The character was 16 years old. So when you say amateur, it's it's like a junior book series. Right. It was for, I mean, I think it was geared toward young tweens and teens at the mm -hmm. time. Yep. So um, I looked at the 13th Pearl. I saw a big resemblance in how Nancy Drew looked and how Taylor looked. So the Nancy Drew book, the 13th Pearl... This was, like I said, beginning of December. Everyone's clowning for December 15th, where are your pearls day? And it, she was going to be in Tokyo next, correct? Yeah, it would have been the first stop. Yep. Yeah, so the book, The 13th Pearl, the cover is Tokyo. They're in Tokyo. She, Nancy Drew. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't read the book, so I don't know like the whole plot. Um, I think Anna has some stuff about plots later. But um, the thing that that stuck out to me, because for a very long time now, we've been talking about pseudonyms, ghost writers, that type of thing. We know Taylor's done it in the past. We know Joe Alwyn did it under William Bowery. Taylor has used Nils Sorgeberg. So the Nancy Drew series is written by Carolyn Keene, who is not a person. It's a pseudonym. It's a pseudonym for several different people actually um that worked on these books but i just found it interesting that okay i think she's having us look more into like the pseudonym thing because hand to my heart like full stop i think taylor's written several things that we have heard read seen that we have no idea it's her well in the paul mccartney interview they talked about how Paul has done that, I guess. He's written under pseudonyms. He wanted whatever he was working on to live on its own life without his name tied to it. And then she talked about it as well. And that really, I mean, that wasn't that long ago, 2020? That was 2020. Yes. No, actually, November 13th, 2020, that article came out. And that's an article we have gone back to several times and referenced and if you guys follow nikki king on tiktok she has a lot of stuff about that article and the beatles and paul mccartney and how it relates to taylor but 
There's a lot of very interesting tidbits in that article. I highly recommend you guys go read it. Yes. Yeah, it definitely does. There's some stuff that like we're still stuck on that will come to fruition probably here in the next couple of years. But um, yeah, the pseudonym thing you just said about how multiple authors under a single pseudonym, and it got me thinking about the William Bowery thing, because we know that William Bowery is Joe in folklore because she said that during the Long Pond Studio sessions, we can probably assume his references in Evermore are true, but he, William Bowery, is on Sweet Nothing, which is on Midnight's, and a lot of people think that that is written about Paul McCartney and his wife, right? Sweet Nothing? Sweet, yeah. I. A lot of people think that William Bowery credited on Sweet Nothing is Paul McCartney. Is that where Be you're going with that? Yeah, well, because it is... Uh, like the I wrote on the way home, I wrote a poem. Um, you said what a mind is something that Paul McCartney has said and then her and um, him when he met the author of the article talked about his family and stuff. So I think she got exposed a little bit to his sweet life. And I could see where if she did, even if she and Joe wrote it, I could see where that song references Paul McCartney's life and his love. Um, mm -hmm. So then that's where, yeah, that is where I'm going. So if Carolyn Keene is a pseudonym with multiple writers, could William Bowery also be? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to die on that sword right now. I promise. I'm just throwing it out there. Well, no, I think, I think it's important to talk about because I've seen a lot of people say that, oh, William Bowery is actually Paul McCartney, um, especially in Sweet Nothing. And I like 100% wholeheartedly disagree with that. And yep. I know you don't, I know you don't, um, well, which is fine. The, the Grammy thing is hard because once you win a Grammy under the pseudonym, then it's like, can you really swap see who it is? Yeah. I just, I, I think that when Taylor told us in folklore that Joe is William Bowery, that's what it was and that's what it is. And I honestly, I had said this, I think I said this in a TikTok that I think that Taylor and Joe wrote a lot of music together, especially in quarantine. And I would not be surprised if you see William Bowery on the tortured poets department. And I'm saying, not that I'm saying that, oh, they wrote a breakup song together because they were breaking up. I'm saying, what if she pulled something that they had unfinished that they were working on? Yes. And, and she added him as a credit. Yes, he would get paid. He'd get royalties, but wouldn't that be like a final just like slap in the face to credit him on something and have well, it finished? It should take something that they worked on together and turn it into whatever she does. So one thing I watched last night was from 1989. There was an interview she did at the album release with some kids talking about reading. And she was talking about poetry. And she referenced that this love from 1989 started as only a poem in her journal. And so I could see where you're talking about with William Bowery being credited on Tortured Poets. If that comes to fruition, it could be as simple as them writing lyrics down that they're thinking about. And then in the same vein with blank space she pulled in a bunch of pre-written kind of one-liners to make that song so like if she's using anything that he potentially helped her come up with and maybe that's where some of his references came with like coney island and some of the other ones right isn't he yeah he's on he's on one. yep he's on coney island betty exile um i believe evermore um and I just wouldn't be surprised. Like, I don't think the money matters to her. So like if some of the royalties go to him and they're broken up, fine. I think it's more of just like, you're a part of this breakup too. Yeah, and exactly. This is something that we maybe started a while ago and I finished it, but I'm still going to credit you as William Bowery. People know who that is. And I really, I don't think Tortured Poets is going to be a diss track album. I don't think so either. I actually was thinking about the timing of it being right after she turned in Midnight's and we know they were not broken up then. It could be the actual fallout. Yeah. I, I versus think that, the post. Yeah. I think that we're going to get a clearer picture of maybe what happened with Joe, but, and maybe there are some scathing lyrics or songs, but I think that there will be about her too, herself. Yeah, oh, yeah, there's gonna be a ton. I mean, there's a lot of fault in both ways when you start to kind of fall out of love like that. So well, and there's two sides to every story. So there's her side, his side, and then what really happened. And then our side. 
<laughs> our theory side. <laughs> the, so the I'm TikTok trying not side. I'm trying not to theorize so much about what happened with them until I hear the album a couple times. Um, yeah. but obviously there's been, you know, chit chitter chatter talk about him being unfaithful, but we don't know. I think that there's gonna be songs on there about Maddie Healy too. Yes. Wouldn't that be the spin of the tale? Okay. Well, um, I what were we just Carol Keene did? Yeah. So Car yeah, Carol Carolyn Keene. So in so going back to karma. I Spice is sitting in an open oyster, like a pearl with a pearl. So that kind of tied into that Nancy Drew book as well, the 13th Pearl. But it's not just this book. There's more. So I'm going to have Anna start that conversation. Okay. So one thing kind of circling back to December that I really noticed was there is a book cover that Nancy Drew is on where she looks identical to Taylor with the red hair in the babe music video. And so guys, look it up, look up the Nancy Drew book covers, um, because she actually is pictured with red hair and all of the, um, most of the artwork is red, but in the first book, she's described as blonde hair, blue eyed. So just an interesting note. Um, and did she's you know 16. That? No, I didn't. And she's 16, right? Yeah, she's 16. I believe, I don't know if every book she's 16 or if it's just, if she ages. Um, but yeah, this book series started way back in like the 1930s. And what's really interesting is that it's had many different series over time. So you have like the original publications. Um, and then, you know, they had the Nancy Drew Files, which was in the 80s and 90s. They had the Nancy Drew Girl Detective series, which is a little bit newer. The most current one is called the Nancy Drew Diaries. So like Nancy Drew is not just one series. It's kind of this almost like a Marvel universe or like a Taylor universe of sorts, right? Like it, it transcends one central theme. So is it like it's like become a brand? Almost? Yeah, a brand. That's a perfect way to put it. It's a brand. Okay. So I did not know that actually. So I thought there was just a series of books that came out in the 50s, which apparently I was way off on that. And that was it. So mm -hmm. what, I did not know that. Okay, so it, I wish I had the actual date, but it definitely came out before the 50s because, um, I mean, my mom has some of the originals, like not the yellow and blue, but like, they're like brown books, you know? And so um, they essentially started out like the 30s, I know some of the publication, but in the 1950s, the book series was bought by a new publishing company and they did not like how feminist that she was and they wanted to combat some of that and they also wanted to kind of cut out some of the plot. So all of the original books, I believe there was 34 original that when they were purchased, they were kind of revamped, rewritten and republished. So like the re-recordings. All the books? All the first 34, yeah. There are two versions, and the original version is very, very hard to find. Really? Yeah, yeah. So they were, okay, so they cut out some of the plot lines. They altered the plot lines for some. All of the book artwork is different. So like if you were to search for the 13th Pearl, you may come across multiple book covers. And a lot of times that represents the old artwork <laughs> versus the new artwork. Wow. Okay. No, I did not know that. So that connects it to Taylor even more. Exactly. And what's interesting, though, is that each of the original series had about 25 chapters. And then when they revamped them, they all went down to 20 chapters. So it seems like they cut out, but some of them are like the same length. So it's not necessarily like, oh, they, they shortened all of them. It's just that they rewrote. And some of the things that I was researching, like some of the plot lines that they took out were just like unnecessary and didn't like push forward the story. Um, but yeah, at other times they really did change the narrative of the actual um, storyline. Why would they do that? Because uh, it was the 1950s, and I think some of it, and honestly, there may be some of it that uh, was out of date from like a, what they're referencing. So they thought that the 30s versions were too feminist, and they revamped them to be less feminist, or they were not feminist enough. Which way would it go? 
they were not they did not like how much of a feminist she was and to combat this they took the first 34 books and published them again with new art altering some of the plot lines and adjusting nancy nancy's character herself yikes and some of the publications have the same title but a completely different plot line i'm gonna pause real quick and credit that's so katie which is uh k sweezy reads is how i'm reading her handle k s w e z e reads r-e-a-d-s that's on tiktok if you search nancy drew on tiktok her shit's gonna come up she's like all of the videos and search results but i did a lot of like searching on her last night and i'm um, watching some of her stuff so she, she's a good resource and then of course wikipedia so yeah go follow her <laughs> yeah go follow her Okay, so, uh, you know, I spoke earlier about how there's different series within the brand. So you've got, like, the Nancy Drew Files, the Nancy Drew Diaries. There are 13 different series within the Nancy Drew umbrella. 13. Like, yes. the Diaries is one, and then the Files is another, and then there's more. The Girl Detective series, the original books. Um, there are 613 books in total. It adds up to 10. I was doing that in my head. You could probably tell. <laughs> Trust me, I did a lot of math here. That's crazy. Yeah. Okay, no, this isn't even it, Jesse. Like, this, this, it gets crazy. Okay, so there, let me actually real quick check my TikTok. Okay, so um, there is what they call these, like, interactive keepsake books. One of them is called... The Lost Files of Nancy Drew, and it's essentially supposed to be a book of Nancy Drew, who's a character. It's supposed to be like her journal, her book, and so you basically like flip through it, and there's like journal entries and clues from the cases, Easter eggs, how to become a better detective, like there's tips. And so this Katie girl has this TikTok where she's like flipping through and talking about when she was like 11, like she would like take it to go get her hair cut and just her enthusiasm surrounding this book to me makes me think one, could Taylor have had one of these books growing up? And that's why she loves Easter eggs and clues. And even going back to the very first album that she released, she was dropping clues in the lyric books for us. Um, and two, just the idea that like, what if, you know, how the vinyls are the kind of books it show they show like there's pages flipping what if the vinyls are like these kind of interactive keepsakes where we can see like journal entries and just different things that like different clues for the songs you know like i could see taylor if if this nancy drew thing is correct i could see her leaning further into it because <laughs> nancy drew has 33 video games yeah three 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 yep as in the picture of taylor three three yes from her birthday okay as in the 33 fucking puzzles to solve for 1989 no those were 89 puzzles right no 33 33 are you sure there wasn't 89 puzzles look it up Oh, it was 33, 33 million. Google. It was 33 million. 33 million. Yeah. I knew it was a 3-3. Three, three. Yeah. Okay. Whoa. Now you're freaking me out. Okay. So let's let's talk though. So real quick, backtrack. Taylor Swift has a post on her Instagram from December 13th of whatever year she turned 33. 2023. Thank you. Um, no. 2022. 2022. 2022. Um, and she is holding up two threes. One hand has three fingers and the other hand has three fingers. And so that's why we were like 33. Um, and since then, like the 1989 interactive puzzle game, let's talk about that. So the video games for Nancy Drew are ones where you kind of like click around and look for clues in mansions or different series, right? I did not know about that. Okay, so during the 1989 Blank Space music video, she partnered with American Express. Guys, look this up on YouTube. There was a 1989 interactive puzzle game that fans could go to. It was like online, and you could click around the mansion, and you were solving puzzles and would get keys 
let's talk back. Remember when we were just singing hits different? Is that yes. your key down the door or down the hallway, whatever? Well, isn't her stage a key? Her stage is a key because we know that because during the puzzle game that we played on Google recently for 1989 Taylor's version, when the vault opened, the key dropped and it was the shape of the stage. So that's how we know the stage is a key. Okay, so 1989 Taylor's version, there was the Google puzzles that we solved. 1989 original, there was an interactive, completely Nancy Drew style game. There are people online who played it on YouTube. So go check it out because at the very end, Jesse, you unlock the vault and it revealed a home video of Taylor, which I don't think had been seen before, of her parents giving her a bike. For Christmas? Mm -hmm. It wasn't for Christmas. I think it was like her birthday, but yes. I've seen that video. That's got to be important. Why did why that video? Why was that what was unlocked? Well, and then think about the bikes in the tour. Haven't you been kind of thinking about how the 1989 set has bikes in them? And I think she rode the bikes uh, in the Blank Space music video. But that's so weird that if you get through the video game thing that she did and you unlock it, that that's what you get. Yeah, it was fucking weird. What? Look that's it up on weird. YouTube. It was weird. So can, can you still play the game? I don't think so. I don't think so. I mean, I didn't even look. Let's be honest. I just assumed not. So, um, okay. So Taylor has done a Nancy Drew-esque video game. So that's another thing that really ties this together. And then the 33 million. 33 puzzles. million. And I On just. Google. I just feel like the artifacts, like the little knickknacky things that are going to come with the CD that you can kind of see online. I just feel like that reminds me of those interactive books that, that she had where you kind of have the little flippy pieces and it comes with like bookmarks and stuff like that. So did Nancy Drew ever have a series of like build your own adventure or like alternate endings? Yes. Stop. Yeah. A couple of the games are, I think they had alternate endings. Because if you guys are just tuning in now and you don't know, Anna has a theory that the albatross, the bolter, the manuscript could be different alternate endings of the Tortured Poets Department album. Yes. Yeah. And that, I think, only exists in a couple of the video games. I don't think it's like a Nancy Drew brand-wide theme. It's not like her books have alternate endings. Um, but yeah, the some of the games do. So, are you ready for some plots? Uh, yeah. Okay. Let's start with the one that is the probably least tied to Taylor. Um, the Ghost of Blackwood Hall. So, Nancy Drew's jeweler, customer Mrs. Putney, asked Nancy and her friends to help recover her stolen jewels. The search for the thieves take Nancy, Bess, and George to New Orleans which Taylor's going to, and Mrs. Putney's odd behavior and the two young women involve Nancy in a case involving a cruel hoax being perpetuated at the abandoned Black Hall. So hoax, New Orleans, and stolen jewels. You wear the jewels when I bury you. What is it? That's what was coming to me, too. I, I wear the same jewels that you buried me. Wait. You wear the same. You wear the same jewels I gave you as you bury me. There it is. Yep. Yep. Okay. So that's that. Um, we've got the the secret of the old clock. So obviously Taylor loves a good clock right now. This is actually the very first book, the very first Nancy Drew book. Okay. So six-year-old Nancy Drew wishes to help the Turners because there's always like some other character. So she wishes to help the Turners who are struggling relatives of a recently deceased Josiah Crawley by finding a missing will that can give them claim to Crawley's estate. Okay. So we're thinking anti-hero. Yep. Okay. So she becomes interested in the case because she dislikes the Crawley's snobbish, novu, rich, social climbing errors presumptive, right? So whoever was presumptively supposed to get the will, she doesn't like them. They're arrogant. So basically, let's- Like her children? 
kind of okay but i'm gonna spoiler where the will's hidden it's in the it's in the clock um okay so the climactic scene where when she finds the will you know she's obviously delighted because the arrogant snobby people who thought they were going to get the will are no longer going to get it and then the poor families are so this is from wikipedia although charitable and altruistic to the poor errors she enjoys seeing others in River Heights society lose their status earned by the new money rather than character. That reminds me of Antihero. She says altruism in Antihero. And I don't know this from Wikipedia, so I don't know if that's like literally somebody just happened to use that word in Wikipedia, but it feels like that might be part of the plot. No, I take Wikipedia as Bible. Like it's it's <laughs> the dictionary for me. It's yeah. yeah, everything on Wikipedia is true to me so that reminds me of antihero and also her last will and testament leaving the beach house aka holiday house as a cat sanctuary which to me i think cat sanctuary i think that's her catalog of work yes yeah so that was that was one i mean just the i mean you could just give me the title the old clock and i think it's related to taylor so the fact that they were looking for a will and that there was the term altruism used in it and that it went to the people who needed it versus the snobby family like this is very anti-hero yes okay so then there is let's do the clue in the diary which is a book where Nancy on the cover of it is standing in front of a house that is burning down. So, yeah. That's nuts. Because we're talking about her burning down a house in the Eras tour throughout this whole thing. And now Nancy Drew has a literal cover where behind her the house is burning down. Yes. So then, of course, I read the plot. Well, Wikipedia, the plot. So um, to top it all off, the owner of the burned down house, Felix Raybolt, is missing and his wife claims joe swinson has murdered her husband ray bolt it turns out swindles investors like swinson out of their patents and copyrights and used one such invention to start the fire copyrights yes so he swindles and steals copyrights and inventions and one of the inventions that was stolen was actually one of the ones that also started the fire. So Taylor is starting the fire. I mean, like, I, it makes me think of how she's about to start the fire and burn the shit down. Uh, what's, is that from Ivy? Yeah. So yeah, it's a war. It's a, so yeah, goddamn it's blaze a fire. In it's a yeah. goddamn blaze in the dark and you started it. And that's the part of Ivy that she sang when she did the mashup. Mm -hmm. That was the only part. Yeah. So like, it's a war. She's burning something down. Okay. So you want to talk about war? So there's one called The Secret in the Old Attic. And it's where Nancy searches for clues to the missing music manuscripts written by a late soldier, Philip March. Mr. March recruits Nancy to help find his son's unpublished music. Stop. Missing music manuscripts. Okay, this is too wild to be a coincidence. I know. I'm about to drive over to my mom's house and fucking get these books because, so, yeah. I think I told you this when I was like t nine or 10, right? My aunt gave me a box of all the Nancy Drew books that she had growing up. They're probably worth a lot of money. I never read them. No. I don't know where the fuck they are. I'm sure they're in some goodwill in someone's house now, but like I should have kept them. Like, what was I thinking? They were all hers when she was growing up. I'm so mean and I just didn't read them. And I'm just like, mm. well, yeah, my mom always looked for them. She even had, I remember she had like a list in her purse of ones that she was still missing. So like if we'd be like out, you know, on vacation, we'd stop by like an antique mall or like, you know, something like wow. resale. She would like find Nancy Drew books and like, try and fill in her collection. And that's a big thing. Like even this Katie girl who I mentioned on TikTok doesn't have the full collection of originals. Like they are very hard to come by. Another thing that I had learned is that um, the publishing company tried to fool people and actually backdate
updated some of the books that they had created like in the 50s to have earlier publishing dates so even if you have a book that has a publishing date in the like inside of an earlier than the 1950s date it could still not be one of the original stories which it's giving me like Taylor vibes. Like, you know, we bought yeah. all the damn vinyls, like take my money, Taylor capitalism. But like, it's like, you know, this whole concept that the originals are so hard to come by. And, um, and there is this whole collection and this brand and this series with these games. Like it's a much bigger thing than just 34 books. That's crazy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if you guys have read any of the Nancy Drew books or if you have other titles or like plots, like I just feel... I mean, there's no way that Taylor is really that into like criminal justice. And like at 16 years old, she was saying she wanted to become a cop or criminal investigator and like didn't read Nancy Drew books. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Definitely. Okay, guys. So obviously we filmed before Friday. We're not that magical. So by the time you're listening to this, the Taylor film, the Eras Tour film will already be available on Disney+. Plus. But a lot of things have happened this week. We are filming on Wednesday night. So I do want to talk a little bit about what we're expecting. Um, and then also, Jesse, you want to talk a little bit about what happened on GMA and just kind of what's happening this week thus far. Yeah. So like Anna said, we're filming on Wednesday, which is the 13th. Happy 13th. Ooh. Um, so there it, to me, it's all very weird, and maybe it's not to other people, but GMA. It, and Taylor Nation is calling this Taylor Week because she's dropping, originally was dropping the Eras Tour movie on the 15th. Now it's backed up a couple hours, so 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern, which means that it's going to be wrapping up around midnight on the 15th. Um, so there's some theories about, okay, what's going to happen? Could something happen at midnight? Um, but I feel like it's very odd they're talking about this being Taylor Week when the era's tour movie has been out forever since uh, her birthday right D or october last year well it came out october 13th in yeah. theaters and then yeah you're right the week of her birthday or her birthday it came out for purchase and it was for purchase until just recently well so just to me just about everybody's probably seen it and if you don't have Disney Plus. I mean, I'm sure a lot of people are buying Disney Plus so they can watch this. But I just find it odd that they're calling it Taylor Week. They also said that each day they're going to reveal four new acoustic songs that are going to be on it, which to me didn't really hype me up that much. I don't know about well, you. Is it four new each day or is it one each day and four total? One each day. Yeah. So, But it doesn't make sense. One each day, four new acoustic songs. So, but they didn't do one Monday. So Tuesday, they announced that Maroon would be one. Today, Wednesday, they announced Death by a Thousand Cuts is the second one. So what are they going to do? Announce two tomorrow morning? That's weird to me. Well, it's weird because when you told me Taylor Week on Monday, I was like, fuck, yes, <laughs> like, let's go. And nothing really has happened. <laughs> no, no. And Taylor Nation's posts are very odd. I need to look into those more because they're giving a lot of like different eras stuff mm -hmm. like to promote the movie. But I feel like there's Easter eggs in there. But it just like Taylor Week to me is like the week that poets now tortured poets would be enough like ready to come out like yeah like ma midnight's happening. mayhem with me like yeah yeah well, and what's weird is and so just to clarify it's not that we're like not excited about the movie or that you know we're not trying to like downplay that but it's just like the idea of it being taylor week and the only thing we really know we're getting is a movie we've all kind of already seen it's like mm -hmm. not it's just not aligning with like the hype that we expected, especially because with the GMA, I believe in GMA's like uh, info section ahead of the airing of the show, people were noticing that it said Taylor documentary or something like Ares for documentary. And so people were speculating, oh my God, there's like an actual documentary, but it probably was just the Ares tour movie and they mislabeled it as documentary. I mean, I guess it probably if you're going to blur the lines, it probably is more of a documentary than anything, but 
I'm pretty certain there will be a documentary at the end of all this about the tour yeah. and about her re-records and all that. But it has me thinking, and by the time you guys are listening to this, we're going to know if something else happened along with it. I mean, shit, we could have Reputation. Taylor's version, we could have debut. We could go back to the beginning. We could get a documentary. I mean, like, it's it's weird. They're just calling it Taylor Week, and they're dropping what seems to be like Easter eggs, but it's not anything... It, like you said, it's for a movie, a film that probably 90% of Swifties have seen. Have you seen Danny book, book Swifty, I think is her handle. Uh, have you seen her video about whenever she was in this studio and she had the two fingers up in the Long Pond studio when she was wearing the Argyle and the Jesse loafers? Mm -hmm. She was like, what if it's an evermore um, Long Pond? <sighs> I know. I know. No. I don't want to get you excited. Everyone will know the answer by the time this airs. <laughs> so yeah. we're like, no. And yeah, no, I did not. I did not <laughs> see that. But yeah, anything Evermore or Woodvale sends me into a tailspin. So. I know. I'm like, I just, you only have 24 hours when we figure this out. So guys, if nothing does drop at midnight, uh, TSPN is about to drop at midnight because I will be editing it throughout the, watching the movie. So I'll try and get it up by midnight so that at least there's something to look forward to. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, uh, get your popcorn and party on Thursday night. I mean, watching the movie, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I mean, I'm excited. So well, in past tense, we hope you got your popcorn on. Um, all right. And then it's kind of circling back. We talked a little bit about Jason, Kelsey, his retirement, the podcast with D. So he won, uh, him and Travis <laughs> won the iHeart radio podcast awards, the top prize. They did. And guess who they thanked? Swifties. The, the Swifties. Uh, Jason Kelsey said the 92 percenters, a.k.a. the Swifties, and then just kept talking. <laughs> Which you I know, love we, that. I love that Jason acknowledges us like even more than Travis. <laughs> Yeah. Well, and it's Travis's girlfriend. He's trying to play it cool. But yeah, uh, we even got a comment on our YouTube about how it was, you know, it was a common uh, podcast before. It was very, very popular, which we obviously acknowledged last time. And we know that they absolutely had plenty of views and plenty of fans before the Swifties came along. But winning the top podcast of the year through iHeartRadio podcast, that's a pretty big fucking deal. It is. Yeah. So. So go ahead and leave us a bunch of comments and give us five-star <laughs> reviews and share with your friends so that someday we can shout you out and get up there and win podcast of the year. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. That is the prize. That is our goal. No, That's the uh, goal. that was not our goal until just now, but now it is now. We'll make a yeah, mood board. New goal. <laughs> Manifesting. Yeah, exactly. Um, all right, great. Well, let's talk about exposure. And the TikTok ban, kind of wrapping Oof. up here. Um, so if you are aware, hopefully by the time you're listening to this, there's more developments in the positive direction. But um, today on Wednesday, the entire House voted on the TikTok ban for United States. Prior to that, it was just a committee. So it was a unanimous committee vote. Now the whole entire House has voted on it. And so next it will go to our Senate who will have to vote on it and pending no changes because it could always go back to the house if there's change or whatever. Um, it could get signed by the president and then there would be the power to ban TikTok. So it's not like the second the president signs it that all of a sudden TikTok is banned, but it's just not looking good. We went through this March of last year, 2023, and I definitely made a lot of videos about it and had my own kind of panic. This time feels different. It feels more real. It felt really real last time. I don't know. How are you feeling? I feel sad because I feel like it's just another freedom that's getting taken from us. And I'm sad for the people that get their livelihood and make their money off of TikTok. I mean, you know how many jobs that's going to lose for people? I mean, and content creation is a job now. I mean, that is a job. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and there are, I mean, there are whole social media companies around influencer brand marketing and stuff like that. So, and again, not to say that influencer brand marketing would go away, but if somebody worked at an agency that was staffed and now, you know, a whole leg of it, I mean, I've done paid partnerships with the Goose Company. <laughs> shout out to Gaggleville. This is a free shout out. Um, but I have a Porch Goose that, um, and they've been so 
gracious and have actually done sponsored posts with me, that income would go away. And for them, that exposure goes away, not just from my account, but for other people that they're partnering with. And so it is really sad from from that standpoint. But I think further, it's an app that allows us to connect and to, you know, get entertainment and to see what other people are up to and hear about news from other states and other countries. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll definitely, we'll see how it shakes out. But I think the biggest thing that Jesse and I really wanted to hit on is we're not going anywhere, even if our TikTok goes bye-bye. Mm-hmm. I mean, we will still be here every Friday for you guys and full of the latest Taylor Swift content, theories, everything. So we wanted to make sure that you guys are subscribing and sharing with your friends mm-hmm. and following and you know the whole thing because I mean not to scare anybody because we don't know, but if TikTok does go away, we have there's other avenues. So we have this podcast. We also have a website Yep. T- tspodnetwork.com. We have um, an Instagram, tspodnetwork, right? Yep. Yep. It's the same handle as YouTube, tspodnetwork. Make sure you guys go and follow. I would honestly, if you guys could go follow our Instagram, that that would probably be the first step, just so you at least have that done in case something does happen. Mm-hmm. But yeah. exactly, exactly. Um, and obviously Spotify and, and Apple Podcasts, if that's where you're finding us, you're fine. But it would help us and it would be a great support because Jesse has built up, you know, 34, 38, I don't know how many you have now, but th- 30 plus thousand Swifties follow Jesse. My following is a mixed bag of who and fucking knows who. A lot <laughs> of you are Swifties, so shout out. But um, to think that all of those Swifties are going to lose access to daily content by Jesse is where, you know, maybe it's going to be Instagram. Maybe it'll be on this YouTube channel that we have together, um, but we'll figure it out. We'll make content still if it happens. Definitely. And I did want to let you guys know because you guys are so loyal and I love you guys so much. I did create an Instagram. Um, you can click it through TikTok, but it's Jesse Swift Talk on Instagram. And that will be where my Taylor content will go if TikTok goes away. But I would just make sure you're following us just in case. Yep. Yep. Jesse Swift talk underscore on Instagram. Yep. Yeah. Mine was taken too. Mine is creative chronicles underscore underscore. (laughs) There's two underscores. Okay. Yeah. So make sure you're following both of us on Instagram. Make sure you're following the pod. Yep. I I hate Instagram personally posting to it because of the way in which it promotes the content to people I know, but whatever. Um, We'll do that for you. We'll sacrifice our own personal, like, you know, worries of what people in our lives think. Not that we really care. Well, that's why I start. That's why I started a different one. It's just a completely different one for my Swifty friends. Yep, exactly. Exactly. So speaking of TikTok, if it does stick around, Jesse and I discovered that since we're both logged into the TikTok app on our individual devices, that we are having issues with our messages. So when I log into the TikTok, if you've messaged the podcast, it is downloaded to probably my version of the TikTok app on my phone. And if Jesse is the one who's logged in. And so we're like, I'm like, Jesse, there's all these unread messages. And she's like, I, I messaged them all. And the more that we kind of played this game, I realized, oh my God, I think we have two versions of the truth. So I will try and go through and answer a lot of them. A lot of the things that people send, I want Jesse to see more than me just because they're more theory based. Um, But let's, I'm probably going to turn off the TikTok messaging function within the TS pod network um, TikTok. So if you do want to get a hold of us, find the Instagram, you can message, message us there. There's also a contact form on our website. And then of course, our direct inboxes are more than fine if you want to just message me or Jesse directly. And our, our our emails will be in our bios. So exactly, exactly. Um, all right, so we will wrap for today. We are going to drop a little mini episode because Friday the fifteenth is the Ides of March, and if you don't know, the Rep era was very coded in the Ides of March. Julius Caesar, Cleopatra, snakes, cobras ancient Egypt. There is so much to it. So we will also be dropping our very first mini episode. So catch that after you're done here or unless you've already watched it. 
And then we are going to start our next series. So we'll continue to do weekly episodes, but the series that we are going to be working on is Swifty 101. We are going to cover pre-debut all the way through the original eras, through the Taylor's version eras, all the way up till now. Yep. So we are starting with debut. I've even quoted a few things from debut interviews and just media. One of the things I'm really excited about, we're going to create kind of a syllabus with um, resources. So we'll do our episodes. We'll do our best to recap the eras as concisely as two girls who love to talk can. And then if you want to go further, we'll have all of those interviews and links to articles and anything that we utilize will be available. So think of it as kind of like a little course. And um, by the time you're done, you will hopefully be able to speak all the tailoredness that we do. And um, and yeah, it'll be a good time. Well, what I think is fun too, is whether you're a new Swifty or a vintage Swifty or like, you know, whether you've been around since 06 or you've been around since this year, it doesn't matter. It's yep. like a refresher. If you haven't, um, it's, it. I mean, there's some things that doing the research, I didn't even know. Um, and then if you haven't, it's just learning all about, you know, Taylor and the original eras and making you become a bigger Swifty. I know. Same. There's stuff that I've learned that even, I mean, think about the Nancy Drew shit that was born out of an interview that I watched from her when she was 16 guys, Taylor watches this stuff back of herself and she draws into it. So yes. don't think that just because we're saying that something is tied back to something 10 years ago, that Taylor was planning 10 years ahead. What she does is she'll find something significant in an old music video or an old interview, and then she'll pull it forward. Um, mm -hmm. So it is so interesting to go back and watch all that stuff. Absolutely. Awesome. All right, guys. Well, catch the Ides of March mini episode that's dropping. And then we will be back here next Friday once again to talk about whatever is hip hop and happening in Taylor world. And as always, we love you guys. Bye.